morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see each of you here this morning. We know that there are those who are under the weather. We know that the weather, though turning out to be a pretty day today, has not been that great of late. Still plenty of snow on the ground and ice. So do be careful as you're out and about. Don't want to have anyone slip and fall or or have a wreck or anything. So I would encourage you to, to be very cautious. Before we get started, and I put this in the bulletin so you can read for yourself. I'm not going to read what I wrote, but I want to express to you my gratitude. Of course, I was sick. Um, I guess it's been a little over a week now. I had the flu. And uh, that was not much fun, but uh, so many did so many different things, both members of the congregation and members of the church broadly, and, and others uh, did so much in, in uh, being there helping in so many ways, whether it was filling in for me or, or bringing things there to the house or whatever. And, and again, as I indicated in the bulletin, I know I'll leave somebody off, so I'm just so Thankful to each of you who, who did anything, and you know who you are, and, and I appreciate it. It is encouraging when we see that in those times of our need that there are those who are there for us. And what a wonderful uh, thing it is to be uh, able to see that, and it, you are to be commended, uh, those who did that. And we all should be more like that, to help others when uh, they need uh, that, that help. I would ask you to... Bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, as we gather here this morning to worship you, we pray that we'll set aside the cares of this world, that we'll set aside the things that would distract us, that we'll focus on, on why we are here, that we will worship you in a pleasing and acceptable manner, that it will bring you joy, Father, that it will be pleasing to you. Father, we pray that we may build one another up, that we may admonish one another, that we may strengthen one another as we uh, strive uh, to go through this life and, and one day be with you. We pray for your strength, for your guidance, for your wisdom, Father. It is in Christ's most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Once saved, always saved is something that I know we are familiar with. We have probably heard that, Perseverance of the Saints, uh, <coughs> if you're using uh, Calvin's tulip, it is how that it is, is described. But either way, as we know, and, and our lesson today is not on, uh, specifically on this issue, but as we know, there are those, there are many who teach this doctrine, this false doctrine. It is a false doctrine. The Bible does not teach this, this false teaching. It does not teach uh, us uh, such things. We know that they take, and, and they would argue if anyone was here and, and held to that view, they would argue, they would say, well, you look at, for example, John chapter 10, and where Jesus is talking there, beginning with verse 25, Jesus answered to them, I told you, and you believe not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out, of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And they will look in that text and they will say, well, you see there, Robert, they, they, will, they shall never perish, it says. It it's emphasizes this, that no one can pluck them out of his hand. We've said before, and again, our lesson today is not on this false teaching, but we've pointed out before that indeed no one can steal our salvation. No one can take it from us. But this text, and no text, teaches that we cannot 
turn away willfully, that we cannot refuse to be what God would have us to be. How many people in this world have obeyed the gospel and have then turned from the truth, have refused to remain faithful? We know that this is the case. In fact, we know that there are those examples in Acts chapter 8, for example. We know that Simon there obeys the same gospel, does the same thing that the others did. He both believed and was baptized. So he did the exact same thing they did. They were saved. He was saved. And yet Peter told him that his money perished with him. He was going to be lost, Peter said, because he thought that he could buy the Holy Spirit. That he thought he could buy these miraculous abilities, the abilities that the apostles had to lay their hands upon someone else and impart to them the miraculous. He thought it was something to be purchased so that he could make a living, so that he could make a gain of it. And so Peter, of course, told him to repent of his sin. So there are those who teach, brothers and sisters, this false doctrine. Now, we know that the Bible does teach us that we can have assurance. I, I couldn't help it as I was uh, preparing the lesson, as I was thinking about these things, I could not help but think of the psalm, Blessed Assurance, number 477 in our psalm book. What a beautiful psalm when we sing that song, and, and we do have blessed assurance. We know, of course, Peter, and I often uh, somewhat jokingly point out that Peter teaches this idea of once saved, always saved. Not as false teachers teach it, not as so many denominationalists teach it, but there in verse 10 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter, as we read a few moments ago, Peter does in fact tell us that there is a way that we can have that assurance, if you will, that we can know that we are, quote-unquote, <coughs> once saved, always saved. But there is a, a qualification placed on that idea in, in this text. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. It is possible to make our calling and our election, it is possible to make our salvation sure. But how, Peter? For if ye do these things, he goes on to say, ye shall never fall. If ye do these things, if you do these things that he's laid out there, the Christian graces, then you shall never fall. It is possible to know that we are saved. It is possible to have that assurance, if you will, of our salvation. But it requires that we do the things that God would have us to do. And we need to understand that. The Bible, in this text and others, places responsibility upon us. Many in the denominational world, many Calvinists, in fact, are trying to take responsibility <coughs> off of themselves and place it on someone else. It's nothing I can do. Paul said as much in Romans. Nothing we can do in Ephesians, you know. There in, in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and following, we, we know that Paul said that, that there's nothing you and I can do. We don't earn our salvation. Indeed, to that I would say, amen, we don't earn our salvation. There is nothing we can do that will merit our salvation. But in no text of the Bible does it say there's nothing we must do. That, that we have no responsibility. Over and over, who does God place responsibility upon? Us. Is it based on what Christ did? We, we took the Lord's Supper a few moments ago, and, and Jim was talking, of course, about what Jesus did there on the cross, and we remember that, we remember that sacrifice, and, and certainly we know that our salvation is based on His sacrifice. Without that sacrifice, you, I, no one would have any hope. None of us would have any chance to be saved. We would be lost without any possibility of being saved. Because He is the only way. John 14 and verse 6 we know. And so it is important for us to understand that responsibility is placed upon us. There are those, just like in the world as a whole, who try to take 
the responsibility away and say, there's nothing you can do. You're not responsible for what you do. You just do it and, and, and well, God saves you or he doesn't. God has chosen to save you or he hasn't. And he has made that way. He has, he has saved you. And if he has saved you, then you can do anything in the world. Now, you wouldn't want to, they would say. But you can do anything in the world that you want to. And you cannot possibly be lost. take responsibility off of themselves and place it on God. If I am lost, it's God's fault. That's what they're ultimately saying. If I am lost, it's God's fault because he didn't pick me. I, I couldn't say, I couldn't have done anything anyway. Today, brothers and sisters, our lesson is entitled, Be Sure. Be sure. Be certain, you could say and we, what we are going to look at is, and what we want to understand is that we each need to be sure that our faith is in line with God's Word. We need to be sure that our faithfulness is in line with God. And that we need to be sure that what we teach is in line with God's Word. We begin by understanding, brothers and sisters, that we must be sure that our faith is in line with what God says. Romans 10 and verse 17, a text I know we're each familiar with, and most, if not all, could probably quote the text without any trouble. I would encourage you to turn there, though, and, and, and look for yourself at what the Bible says. Romans 10 and verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Or Christ, some translations say. We must be certain that our faith is in line with God's Word. Now, you've heard me point out before that there is the thought there that with verse 17, when it says, So then faith cometh by hearing. What it is talking about is not our believing, but is talking about the faith. So then the faith, the system, the doctrine, the truth, is from God's Word. But brothers and sisters, our faith is based on what? The faith, is it not? It is based on the Word of God. It is based on what He says. So when we look at this text, even if we take it to say, the faith is by God's Word, or by hearing, by hearing, by the, by hearing God's Word, then in fact our actual believing, our faith, is based thereupon. Someday, brothers and sisters, each and every one of you and me will stand before God to give an answer for the things we do in this life. Someday each one of us is going to hear one of two things. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or depart from me, I never knew you. The former can rejoice that the song there, there's a great day coming. Always, you've heard me point out before that that song is a touching song to me, a very thought-provoking song. There's a great day coming, we often sing. That third stanza, what? There's a sad day coming. Now, when we sing that song, we're not talking about two separate days. We're talking about the same day. It is a great day, brothers and sisters. A great day, one to be rejoiced of. One to, to celebrate if we are right in the sight of God. If we are where we need to be. If we, are, uh, if we have our faith in line with God's Word. But if we aren't, if we don't, then it is a sad day because we will be lost for all of eternity. And we can read such text as Matthew chapter 25 where repeatedly Jesus there teaches the dangers for those who are unprepared. The sheep are on the right hand, the goats are on the left. And, and those goats, we often talk, hear people talk about the goat. Someone called me a goat at work here uh, yesterday, I guess it was. And I jokingly took that, and, and we know it's a, a, an acronym, I guess, uh, where the greatest of all time, and I, I jokingly said, well, you know, I am the GOAT. I am the Muhammad Ali said he was the greatest of all time, but he didn't know me. 
because I'm the greatest of all time. You know, joking, of course. But brothers and sisters, when the Bible uses, Jesus uses that analogy, and he's not saying, talking about the greatest of all time. He's not talking about those who, who are doing something good. He's talking about those who are unprepared, those who are not faithful, those who are doing that which is wrong. And, and brothers and sisters, we need to make certain that we are not in that group. We, we look in, in 2 Peter in chapter 1 as, as we read, and, and we're not going to really go through this text, but I want us to understand the context. We read there in verse 10, wherefore the rather... Brother, and give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. What things, Peter? Adding these Christian graces to your lives is what he's talking about there. But let us understand, brothers and sisters, as we recently, not too long ago, I don't guess it was, we went through in Bible class, we went through the, the Christian graces, looking at them. This would have been last year, of course. And we were looking at, at these Christian graces and we studied each one. But we note there, as we did in class, that what is the foundation of all of that? It's faith, right? We go back up to verse 5 and, and, and very beginning of, of in the context here of, of the Christian graces. And beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith. See, they already had faith, Peter is saying. Peter is pointing out that they had faith. Faith based on God's word. Verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the con to the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, they already had faith. Faith is the very foundation, so we must, before we go anywhere, before we do anything, we must make certain that we have faith and that our faith is in line with what God's Word says. Be sure, brothers and sisters, that your faith is in line with God's Word. Don't take someone else's word for it. I don't care who it is. I'll stand here this morning and say, please don't take my word for any of this. I hope that you do trust me. I suppose that sounds contradictory, but I, I hope you say, well, I know Robert does make certain what he's teaching, that he is right, but Robert may be wrong just the other evening. You were here Wednesday night. You heard me point out. And I, I won't go back and say what it was. Uh, it's not important at this point. But I had to stand in front of the class and say I was wrong. Because a couple of weeks, of course I'd missed the previous week with the flu, but, but a couple of weeks prior to this, there at the end of the class, a question was asked about a, a particular point, and, and I answered the question. Almost immediately realizing, now wait a minute, I don't think so. And I went back actually that night and looked at it and, and waited till the, the class. I was going to do it the previous week, of course. Again, I had the flu, but, but I, I pointed out, I wanted to point out in that class that what I said was erroneous. Now, what I said, I didn't mean to be mistaken. I just simply took something and, and got some things in my head, kind of crossed up, and 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 twisted what the Bible was saying there, in, unintentionally, of course. Brothers and sisters, any of us can do that. Any of us can be wrong. I don't care if it's me or Jim or, or, or uh, Bill or John or anyone who stands up and teaches or goes into one of the classes <laughs> and teaches the other classes or what. Any of us can be mistaken on what we are saying. And it may be that. It may just be a mistake that we just misspeak or we misunderstand something. And we need to make certain that we aren't so prideful in ourselves that we think, well, I could never be wrong. 
and that we put so much pride in someone else. There's Robert. There's my preacher. He's my preacher, you know. He, he just, he's just the greatest preacher. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we can't think in anyone it is infallible because none of us are. We can't think that, well, Robert said it, or Jim said it, so I know that it must be true. Brothers and sisters, someday each and every one of us will stand before the Lord and give an answer for the things we did. Notice it doesn't say the things Robert did. It doesn't say the things Jim did. It doesn't say the things John did. And you can insert anyone else's name there. It doesn't say, we know that there are so many big name preachers out there who, who and we know there are those who are both in the church, who, who are in fact preaching the truth, but we know there are others who are big name preachers who who are <clears throat> denominational teachers, teaching, teaching false doctrine. Brothers and sisters, don't go stand before God and say, big name preacher over here said it. Because you see, big name preacher may be wrong. And we need to understand that, that responsibility is on us. Yes, I will give an answer if I teach false doctrine. But understand that that won't save your soul. If you someday stand before God and you say, but Robert said, and if Robert was saying wrong, it won't get you into heaven. Because God, of course, is going to say, well, you had my word. Many people today run around, and there are many in the religious world who run around and don't know anything about the Bible except maybe what the preacher said in his last lesson. And that's what they get. That's what they know. Maybe they remember a little tidbit out of it. Well, my preacher says, and, and I've had people who have, that that's been their response. Well, my preacher said, well, your preacher is wrong. Your preacher may be leading you, intentionally or unintentionally, may be leading you astray, teaching you something that is not true. And the Bible lays the responsibility to make certain of that upon you. We need to be sure, brothers and sisters, by picking up our Bibles, by studying the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2, and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Study your Word. Study the Word of, of God. How can I be in line with the faith, or how my faith in line with the faith, faith coming from God's Word, unless I spend time in studying God's Word? Brothers and sisters, that may be one of those pet peeves I have. Maybe, maybe some might say, well, that's, that's one of Robert's hobby horses. Make sure we study. We read. It's important, brothers and sisters, that we know this. It's important that we understand that we know, that, that we, we understand God's Word, know His Word, and that we are in line with His Word. One of the most beautiful psalms that... that, that I, I like, at least. It's Psalm 1. Very short psalm. Where, where he, he talks and compares and uses this progressive parallelism um, in, in verse 1 there. How that he, this poetry, Hebrew poetry, and, and I pointed this out, and, and maybe, maybe that's kind of like the Greek. When Robert starts speaking Greek, people's eyes close over, glares over. And maybe, you know, I mentioned Hebrew poetry and your, your eyes just lays over it doesn't mean anything but Hebrew poetry is really pretty it's not like ours but but it's really pretty and and, and really thought-provoking and here he, he makes this this illustration uh, this description of of the the descent if you will of a man of a person and and, and the opposite the ascent of a man. 
Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Brothers and sisters, we start out by looking at sin. And, and maybe we long for that sin. We stand there gazing at it. And then pretty soon, what are we doing? We're involved in that sin. And, and you can insert any sin you want, but that's how we so often do. We, we just kind of glance over there. No, it's, it doesn't look so bad. You think that's what Eve might have been thinking when she was there in the garden and, and the serpent was saying, oh, you know, you know she, what did she say? You know, God said, don't, don't, even, don't even touch it or we'll die. Oh, you won't die, Satan tells her. And she starts, oh, what did it, what it do? She looked at it and saw that it was one to be desired, one to make her wise, to give her something she didn't have. And isn't that what Satan said? Isn't that what Satan said? Make God knows that if you eat it, you'll be like him. He's holding out on me. That's, that's what Eve is, is getting in her mind. Is He's holding out on me. And I'm being deprived. But brothers and sisters, she had the word. She, she had what it said. And, and notice, of course, in that text there in, in chapter 3 of Genesis, what did she do? She, she's, her, well, she, of course, was having this conversation with the serpent, with Satan. But she missed... She misplied what, misquoted what God had actually said, didn't she? Go back and look at what God told Adam there in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. How, what did he say? Did he say, don't, eat, don't even touch it let, or, or you'll die? It's not what he said, is it? He said, don't eat it. When the day you do, you shall surely die. There's what he said. If, if you eat it, you will die that day. See, now maybe one can argue with, see, Adam told her, because she wasn't there when, when Adam was told this. So Adam tells her, and he misquoted. He said, don't even touch it. You know, we often tell our children, don't, don't go touch that. Maybe the touching of it won't hurt you, but, but don't even touch it because it might, because it will hurt. But the truth is, whether it was Adam or her, she had the responsibility to make certain that she was in line with God's Word. And we need to, each of us needs to make certain that we are in line with God's Word by studying His Word, by meditating. The, verse 2 here in Psalm 1, but His delight, the, the, the light of the, the man that is in that right relationship with God is the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. Joshua, Joshua 1 in verse 8 is told to, to meditate upon the Word of God. Why, Joshua? Because in doing so, you'll prosper. Now, now that's not talking, per se, about that you're going to get rich. Of course, in, in, in their system, of course, God had promised them blessings that would be there if they obeyed, and curses if they didn't. But brothers and sisters, we prosper by knowing God's will, by, by understanding it. And how much better would we all be if we spent more time in meditating upon God's Word than the things we are meditating upon, the things we do focus on? I, I was commenting again to someone at work, I guess it was yesterday, uh, I was making the point that, that catchers and pitchers report to, to spring training pretty soon. And how much I, it just makes me feel better when they do. Things get better. And, and the reason is, brothers and sisters, I don't mind to, to tell you this, the reason is, is that when catchers and pitchers start reporting, I know that spring is coming. And when spring is coming, all this cold and snow and sickness and all starts to go away. And I don't like the cold I don't like the sickness especially, and I, I, I don't like any of this stuff, and I like springtime. Now hopefully what happens is we have an extended spring instead of like we did, uh, what, a year or two ago where it was literally, we had this week in April where the weather, where the temperatures did this 
from day to day. And then all of a sudden it did this. I don't like 90 degrees anymore than I like 20. But hopefully we have a springtime. But that's, that's what I'm getting at. And I like the phrase. But, but brothers and sisters, we meditate upon these things. We think on these things. And we probably know more about those things than we know about God's Word. And that ought not to be the case. There was a time that I could name every single Braves player on their roster and name several in their minor league system. I, I don't quite keep up with it as well as, uh, as much now as I used to, but there was a time I could do that. But brothers and sisters, could I pick God's Word up, talk about it, teach it, know what it says, know what His will is? Because it matters, doesn't it? Because knowing the names of all the Braves players isn't going to get me into heaven, is it? Or anyone else. Be sure, brothers and sisters, that your faith is in line with God's Word. Be sure that your faithfulness is in line with God. And, and yes, I, I'm kind of playing there on the, the words faith and faithfulness. Understand that it isn't sufficient, brothers and sisters, for us to simply know God's Word. There are many people who know God's Word. Satan knew God's Word. Because... After all, look at his encounter with Jesus. What did he do? He quoted Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. He quotes from the Bible there. He, he doesn't go up there and tell Jesus a li outright lie. He doesn't say something that isn't true. He, in fact, quotes from Scripture. Now, we need to understand that that is the case, that he goes back and he quotes to Jesus scriptures. The thing is, is he is taking it out of context. John Hagee, most of us probably know the name, maybe we do. I, I personally like his voice, I, I must say. He has one of those voices that is just, uh, you can sit and, and just be mesmerized, at least I can, be mesmerized by listening to the man. Of course, he's a false teacher, and the things he teaches is leading so many to hell, but, but he, he sounds good in doing it. I was on the computer here a day or two ago, I guess, and I came across this video on GBN, I think it is, where they, they take and they, they analyze, and, and I wrote Blackwell, I believe it, it is. He, he and another brother on there and they take this video from John Hagee's church's website uh, where they're teaching this idea uh, of the sinner's prayer. And they basically take it and analyze it in context of what the Bible actually says. And they point out in there that, that Mr. Hagee points out, uses quotes from Scripture. But what he is doing is taking many of these texts out of context, taking them and misquote, uh, misapplying them, using them in a sense that they aren't teaching. First John chapter one, for example, they're of course talking about repenting, you know, confessing our our faults, confessing our sins. Yet that text is not talking to the alien sinner who has never obeyed the gospel, but it's talking to the Christian. It's telling the Christian who has already obeyed the gospel his need. We mentioned Simon the sorcerer. If you note there in Acts chapter 8 that Simon the sorcerer, he, he what? He obeyed the same gospel that they all did and of course became the same thing they all became. And yet when he sinned, when he thought he could purchase this ability from Peter and from John, what did Peter say? Peter didn't say, well, Simon, go be baptized again. Go obey the gospel. What did he do? He said, you need to repent of your sins. You need to correct your sin because he is now a Christian who has that ability to go to God and ask Him for forgiveness from the sin that he has committed and to be forgiven. So he doesn't tell him to go do the same thing. 
but he tells him to, to correct it. So we, we need to understand, brothers and sisters, it isn't enough, and, and kind of get back here, it isn't enough for us to, to look at Scripture and think uh, and know what it says, because as we see in these other examples, many people quote Scripture, and yet if we don't understand what is being taught here, uh, and if we aren't doing what is being taught, then it doesn't matter. James chapter 1, we know James 1 and verse 22 where James here says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 25, he, he would go on to say, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Who, James? Who is blessed in his deed? The man who is looking at it and doing it. He is blessed in his deed. He is the one who is blessed. It, it isn't sufficient to know God's word. Brothers and sisters, how many people do you know who could quote Scripture and yet they aren't doing it, maybe even quote it and get it right, know what it actually is teaching, know that they, they need to obey the gospel, know they need to live faithfully, and yet they have some reason that they can or, or that they won't, let's just put it that way, that they won't be faithful. How many people refuse, maybe I'm speaking to the choir today, the proverbial choir here today, how many people refuse to show up for worship service? They, they, they have other things that are, are, are just so pressing and it's got to be taken care of. And, and we understand from time to time there are those times where we can't be there. Maybe we're sick. Maybe, maybe we're not able to be there and, 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 and we're, we're, you know, or, or something, some emergency comes up and we don't make, maybe we're on our way and our car breaks down or, or whatever it is. It, maybe it, it, it takes place and we just don't, we can't make it. But brothers and sisters, how many of us, I, I've said this before, how many of us will gladly offer today a reason why we can't be here for worship service and tomorrow we wouldn't even consider offering that to go to not go to work. Brothers and sisters, if that's the case, then our priority is mistaken. We're, we're getting off somewhere. We're thinking uh, along the wrong lines. Uh, that that we're, we're somehow placing a priority on our work. Can't miss work because we've got to make a living, right? Brothers and sisters, what would we sell our soul for? There isn't a job in this world that pays any amount of money that's worth our souls. I know the one I've got isn't paying me enough for my soul. We need to understand that. We need to understand that we must be doers of the Word. We must be faithful. Not just have faith, but be faithful. In, in 2 Peter, we, we read, of course, and we, we looked a few moments ago there at, at 2 Peter chapter 10 and then backed up. Let's look at it from the other thing. We, we have that foundation of our faith, but, but what does Peter actually say? Add to your faith. It isn't sufficient to have the faith. It isn't sufficient to believe that God is who He is. He says He is, that, that Christ did what He said He did. It isn't sufficient to have that faith if we aren't going to do anything about it. Oh yeah, I, I believe God exists. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, I know a lot of people who are lost and will spend all of eternity in hell believing God exists. They believe now that God exists. I know people who believe that Jesus came to this earth, lived and died, and, and died for their sins. And they will spend all of eternity lost in hell because they are not being faithful to what God says to do. And brothers and sisters, I go back to what I said earlier. Don't look at Robert and say, well, I'm just going to follow Robert. I'm going to do what Robert says. You know, he's, he's just such a great guy. He's a great Christian. Maybe you go the other way and say, I don't want to follow him. Uh, that scoundrel, he's he just terrible. I wouldn't want to be like Robert at all. 
But whoever it may be, we can't look at it and say, well, the preacher or the elders or, or some few in, in, in the church, some few older folks who, who have, the, you know, I can trust them and I, so I can believe in what they say about God's Word and, and I can just kind of imitate them. Brothers and sisters, we may imitate them right into hell with them. And that may sound ugly when I say that, and I don't say that to be judgmental or hateful, but, but understand, if we aren't doing what God tells us to do, then we aren't faithful to God. And I may imitate someone else, but someone may object and say, but wait, didn't Paul, in fact there in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, didn't he say to follow him? Be followers even of me as I am of Christ. So, yes, he pointed at to himself, but only in so much as he was following Christ. Because the alternative would be, if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. Zootopia. Maybe and I have that movie. I kind of get a kick out of that movie. Maybe you've seen it. It's, of course, a kid's movie, but... I'm a big kid, so, you know, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a kid's movie, and it, it's, it's, it's in there they have these lemons. And no, not the little yellow things that taste sour, but these little animals. And, and in, in this, they have these little things, and, and there's this joke, and of course, if you know anything about lemons, you get the joke. If you don't, you probably don't. But, but lemons, apparently, will just follow the crap. And they just kind of line up there and go right one right after another. And all you got to do is get one of them off and the rest of them just follow along. And in this movie, that's what happens is they, they, the, the fox, and not to give away the movie if you haven't seen it, but the fox is selling these popsicles, Paul, Paul sickles as, as he calls them. And, and he's doing this and one comes along and then he just gets one of them to turn and, and yes, the ones in front of that one keep going, but, but this one turns and so they're all turn and just come along and they, they buy these, these little popsicles that he sells. And just follow the crowd. Brothers and sisters, we can't be like the lemons and follow one after another as we follow off. If Christ is going here and we're following and, and, and someone, Jim, I'm going to use you as an example, if Jim turns off, and I see Christ going this way, and Jim turns off this way, I'm not going with Jim over here. I'm going to keep going with Christ. If you see Robert turn off, don't follow me by any means. In fact, do all you can to get me back in the right path with Christ. To be faithful to Him. Here in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter, of course, is, is talking about that foundation of faith and add to your faith. What did he say there in verse 10? Wherefore the rather brother and give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, if you build upon your faith these Christian graces, then ye shall never fall. If you do these things, ye shall never fall. He says here. You need to recognize, brothers and sisters, that it matters, in fact, what we are, are practicing, the things we are doing. It, it, be sure that you are being faithful to God, that you are doing what He has, has set forth. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see beginning in verse 23, of course, we see... That, that Paul here teaches about the, the Lord's Supper. But in the context of that, and keep in mind, that's what he's in, in the context. That's what he's talking about here. But we can make it, as the Bible does in other texts, we can uh, uh, broaden that out to our lives in general. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. We need to look at our own selves, and make sure we are in line with God in what we are doing. Now again, in context here, he's talking about specifically the Lord's Supper. But we need to make certain that that, that applies more broadly as well in other texts. We go on down in verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
You see, if I judge myself and I make certain that I am in line with what God's Word says, then I'm not going to have a problem someday when I stand before God. If I'm making certain that I'm in line with God's Word. But what if I don't? What if I don't examine myself? What if I, I'm not making certain, I'm not being sure that, that I am in line with God's Word? Do I have a problem? I do, don't I? I'm going to have a big problem because if I won't fix my own life, if I won't make certain I'm putting myself in line with God, God's going to be the judge. He's going to judge me. And, and He's going to bring that punishment upon me. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 40. Lamentations 3 and verse 40. Jeremiah here points out, let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let us each search and try our ways based on what God's Word says and make certain that if we are not in line with His Word that we bring ourselves back into line with His Word. Matthew chapter 7. Many people will turn to the text here, Matthew 7 and specifically, in verse 1, judge not, let that ye be not judged. And, and perhaps that's one of the most known texts that anyone can quote. Judge not, lest ye be judged. And, and many people of the world are quick to point that out. Many people in the church are quick to point that out to you. Don't judge, lest you be judged. Of course, we've, we've studied this and we've seen how that they are misquoting, misapplying, taking out of context what the text actually says, but I want you to notice in verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You see, Jesus is, in context here is pointing out, you spend all your time focusing on what your brother over here did. You know, Jerry over here, maybe, maybe he, 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 I don't know, does something he shouldn't be doing, and, and, and I'm quick to get, I'm just all over Jerry. And on some minor little thing that, that, oh, Jerry just is off, and he needs to correct this, and what a terrible person he is for doing this. Some minor little insignificant matter, or, or, or something maybe even that is significant in that he shouldn't be doing it, but, but I'm way further out there than he is. And I'm so busy worried about him that I'm missing that I better get myself right. I've known brethren who were like that. Who, who have no problem seeing everybody else's fault. But for the life of them, they don't seem to see their own. Be sure, brothers and sisters, that you, that your faithfulness is in line with what God says. And then finally, brothers and sisters, we conclude with this. Be sure that what you teach to others is in line with God's Word. You can't help but think Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel 33, and how that, that Ezekiel is, is described in there, and God appoints Ezekiel this, this watch. And, and we can take that, and, and, and yes, he's talking to Ezekiel He's describing that situation, but, but he's, he's talk, talking and we can broaden that out and, and say that we have a responsibility to warn others. And if we don't warn others, then, then there is a danger to our own souls. Yes, if I don't tell Jim down here of what he needs and he doesn't do what he needs to do, he's going to answer for his sins, but I'm going to answer for not warning him when I saw him doing that and vice versa. If Jim sees me off in, in sin and he doesn't say, Robert, you need to come out of that. Yes, I'm going to answer for my sin. But Jim, who knew better, is going to answer for not warning me. Not being a watchman in that situation. And the same can be said about any of us. We can't just say, point at Jim over here and say it's Jim or, or Robert. We, we can point at any of us. 
and, and say that about any of us. And we need to remember, brothers and sisters, we are warned about false teachers. In, in 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophet, prophets are gone out into the world. We need to be warned. And, and here John warns us that, that there are many false prophets out there in the world. And we need to try those spirits. And go back, of course, to, to where we began with. And, and note, of course, the importance therein. Don't take the preacher's word for what you, you believe. Open up the Bible. Try. Test and see if what Robert is standing up saying is what God's Word says. Open up your Bible and look for yourself because standing there and saying Robert said it, Robert may be <coughs> falsely teaching something. We don't take Robert's Word. It isn't Robert's Word that will set you free. But God's Word. John 8, 31 and 32. It isn't Robert's word that's going to judge you, but God's word. John 12 and verse 48. It is God's word that will judge us. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And, and we're not going to read the entire context here. I, I would encourage you to do so, uh, to take a few minutes and read in context here. But, but I want you to notice something here. Peter says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Brothers and sisters, I want us to note there that, that Peter is warning them, and warning through the word, warning us, that there are false teachers out there. But what I want us to catch there as we are talking about that we are not being false teachers, we need to make certain that we are not being false teachers, is what happens to those false teachers. Notice there at the end of that verse, they bring upon themselves swift destruction. Someday, brothers and sisters, each and every one of us is going to stand before God. Those of us who teach, if we teach false teaching, if we teach error, we are going to answer for that. We're going to bring that destruction, that swift destruction upon ourselves. Of course, he goes on there in verses 2 and following and points out there's many who are following